All right, you can please be seated. It's good to be here with you this morning. And uh, I was supposed to have my wife Heidi here uh, with me, and uh, sh she was planning on coming, but then she told me I volunteered to cover for another lady in nursery. Her child is singing in our children's choir, and so our kids are all grown up. And so she's like, well, I'll do nursery for you. And I'm like, but you're supposed to come with me. Anyway, so my boys are taking her out for Mother's Day at Panera, I think is the plan. Um, but anyway, I apologize for my wife not being here, but happy Mother's Day to you guys. We're going to have to change some things with the church, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, I've been wanting to in, um, invent something like this, and I feel like this is a great place to be a big help to you guys. And that is we're going to remove all the pews and just put one at the front. And then when you guys come in, then there'll be nowhere to sit except on the front row. And then when that is full, then another pew will pop up and the one will go back. I mean, you guys are so far there in the back. It's like, you know, I, we don't bite up here. We're actually, it gets kind of lonely. Um, so anyway, but thank you for the few of you that have come up to the front. I appreciate it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's good to be here with you this morning on, um, on Mother's Day. I thought I would start off this morning by um, uh, just kind of explaining to you, sh sharing with you some uh, famous people, what they said about their moms, okay? Uh, the first person that said something really cool about his mom was um, Abraham Lincoln, um, President of the United States, pretty cool guy. He proceeded over the banning of slavery, um, and this is what he said about moms. He said, behind every great man is a great mother. Have you heard that one before? I had heard it before. I didn't know it was him. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was the one that said it. I don't think that's what it says underneath the monument, though. But it, it could be one they could put there. I mean, it would be good, right? Um, maybe a, a sharp contrast. Um, another famous person has something to say about his mom. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte. You guys might know him. He, he uh, conquered most of Europe at the time. Um, now, uh, he, had a, a, a he loved his mom a lot, but um, he did something that you know, sometimes causes trouble in the family. He married this lady by the name of Josephine, and his mother did not approve of the marriage. And uh, so, um, as you know, the story with Napoleon, he had quite the ego, and so he coronated himself as emperor. Um, and there's a, um, I had the privilege when I was 19 years old to go to the Louvre. Um, it's this huge museum there in Paris, and uh, you know they can go see the Mona Lisa seriously overrated um, and uh, but this painting of Napoleon's coronation was impressive the painting that I saw was about as wide as this, the whole church building right here this part here and it was life-size and so it's the painting of the coronation there in Notre Dame and um, the the guide that was showing us the painting said you know what his mom was so mad at him for marrying Josephine that she refused to come to his coronation. So, um, but it was such a big event, right? Uh, so the painter painted her in the painting anyway, as if she was there. Um, so Napoleon, he might have had a bit of a, um, in his older age, might have had some struggles with his mom. But this is what he said about mothers. He said, let France have great mothers and France will have great sons. Well, I agree with that. That's true. All right, and then um, again, uh, uh, another one that you will know, uh, world-famous evangelist Dwight L. Moody. This is what he said about his mom. He said, everything that I have ever accomplished, I owe to my godly mother. Isn't that nice? So, you know, that being said, you often wonder, well, what would moms say about their children? And, <laughs> and, I, and I think, sincerely, they would probably say, you know, uh, that their children bring them a lot of joy. Um, my daughter, Natalie, just, uh, she's going to be graduating from high school here pretty soon. So she had her senior banquet, and they're getting all dressed up in these beautiful dresses and everything. And obviously, Heidi is now helping her. And one of the things that I've always done in my kids' lives is whenever we're sitting around the table or whenever we're doing things like that, I'll stop watching the children and just watch Heidi. And you can see on her face this joy. This is happiness, you know, that only a mom can have, you know. And I was seeing that yesterday. She was just generally so happy. She was able to dote on her daughter, and it was kind of funny. Mom, stop, stop, I'm fine, you know, and all that. 
Um, but there was just an absolute joy on my wife's face, and I'm sure all moms have those moments where their children bring them great joy. But sometimes our children bring more joy than what we really want, right? Um, uh, I read about a mother that had this to say about her child. Um, apparently, the child was going off to school saying things that were displeasing to the mom, and uh, so she said, the mom said to the daughter, I know that there is a crack in your bedroom uh, wall, but please don't go telling people at school that you come from a broken home. <laughs> so she's going around, I come from a broken home. No, you don't. Your, your wall is broken. The home is fine. Anyway, so, um, you know, sometimes our, our children do um, put us in situations where, like, you know, it gives us a couple more gray hairs. Um, my children obviously have given me a lot. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but uh, yeah, so, but we love them, and, and moms are a great, obviously a huge part of that. Um, and I don't think we can overemphasize the powerful influence of a godly mom. You know, our moms are one of the foundation stones of a person's life, uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, and spiritually. Um, they're the foundation stones. I, th I think it could be said that um, our relationships with our moms are one of the primary things that molds and forms our character, um, having that relationship with our mom. And, and that's why it really is appropriate for us this morning just to to pause and to see what the Bible has to say about um, moms on Mother's Day. And so this morning, I'd, I'd like us to specifically look at the life of Eunice and Lois. Eunice and Lois, a godly mother and grandmother. These were two amazing ladies um, who raised their son and their grandson to be a young pastor, and you might know him as having the name of Timothy. It was his mom and grandma that raised him. Uh, so turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. It says there, this is Paul, and he's now talking to Timothy, okay? And he says, I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have a remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So he's just saying, I, I'm praying for you, Timothy, all the time, which is good. Um, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Um, and then this is the part I want you to pay careful attention to in verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. So when Paul wrote Second Timothy, he was in a Roman prison, and he was in prison because he had been preaching the gospel. So if you're going to be in prison... That's a good reason to be in prison, because you were being faithful to the Lord, preaching the gospel. And Paul had established this church in the city of Ephesus, and he had sent Timothy to Ephesus to pastor the church there in his absence. And Ephesus, if you know anything about it, it was an extremely tough place to be as a Christian. Um, and um, really, it was kind of like this battleground, if you will, between Christianity and and hedonism, and hedonism was definitely in the majority back in those days. And, and to a lot of people, it m probably would have seemed foolish to send a young man, right, into such a difficult battleground type situation where he was going to face a lot of difficulty. Um, but Paul sent Timothy in large part because of the biblical influence that Timothy's mother and Timothy's grandmother had on him uh, when he was a child. Apparently, Lois, um, uh, who was Timothy's grandmother, she was the first to accept Christ as her Savior. She's the first to become a believer. And then Timothy's mother, Eunice, accepted Christ as her Savior. Uh, Timothy's father was Greek, so we know from that then. We don't know if his father was a believer or not, but we know that Timothy did not grow up in a traditional Jewish household because his dad was Greek, and you know what the Greeks believed with all their gods and things. So he didn't come from a traditional Jewish background like the Apostle Paul did. Um, and, and basically, um, uh, even though he grew up in this environment, um, Timothy's mother and grandmother saw to it that he was taught the scriptures. Um, essentially, it could be said that Timothy's mother and grandmother were godly women during a time period when being godly was unfashionable. And that makes me think of a lot of moms, what you're dealing with today. Uh, you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to teach your children the ways of the Lord. 
in a society where that is frowned upon, where that is discouraged, where no one even wants to acknowledge God. So if you feel like you're alone, you're not, because um, Eunice and um, Lois did the same thing. And, and so yeah, we face similar challenges that, that they face. So today we're going to take a look and see what is involved with being a godly mother. I have three points I want to share with you on that. What is involved to being a godly mother? And the first thing is a godly mother passes on her faith. She passes her faith on to her children. How do you do that? Well, let's, let's look here at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's read verses 14 and 15. Gives us another clue, another window in, into these ladies' lives. It says there, But continue thou, again, Paul talking to Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We see here that Paul is reminding Timothy that the teaching in God's word that he had received from Eunice and Lois had built in him a strong foundation for him to live life based on faith in the Lord. Um, Timothy's mother and grandmother, they understood the importance of teaching their child God's word at an early age so that he could become a man of God that could make an impact for the Lord so he could glorify God with his life and have an impact on other people's lives. And so we kind of read that and we're like, cool, you know, they taught Timothy the scriptures. No big deal, right? No, it was a really big deal. Um, don't make the presupposition that they had it just like you and I. It, I'm look, I'm, I have my sermon and my Bible, everything here on my tablet. You have it on your phones, right? You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. You probably have commentaries on your phone if you wanted to. You could do various translations of the Bible on your phone. You might have your Bible, printed Bible, with you right now. Um, Old and New Testament, right? You have all of that. They didn't have that. When they were living, the New Testament hadn't even been completed yet. They had the Old Testament, but there weren't that many copies of the Old Testament. They could go to the synagogue, right? And they might be able to have some scrolls of the Old Testament there that they could access, kind of like you would at a library. But even that wasn't that easy because when you open your Bible, what did I tell you to do? Turn to chapter and verse. Did you know that they didn't have chapter and verses back in those days? No, it was just one complete document. We've added the chapters and verses. They're not inspired, by the way, so that we can find stuff a little bit easier. But they didn't have that. So when you think about these two ladies, married to a Greek, um, he comes from a culture where they know nothing about God. They worship all these other weird and crazy um, gods that don't exist. And then they have to then go to the synagogue, and then they have to get access to this information so that they can then teach it to their child and grandchild. And when you think about it that way, my goodness, they had a lot to do. It wasn't so easy to parent Timothy back in those days in the ways of be pleasing to the Lord. And uh, so that's exactly what they did. And it's interesting when you think about children and, and their development, um, experts in child development um, uh, seem to kind of figure out what Timothy's mom and grandma knew some 2,000 years ago. And that's always the case. When you look at the scriptures, it's always like we're trying to catch up to what the scriptures has always been talking about, right? But the experts tell us that between the ages of four and five, most children have already formed a basic set of beliefs and values that will shape their worldview. At the age of four or five, their little worldview is already being determined, already being shaped. Can you see the value that a mom would have in that situation? Now, I was reading a book, actually, I think it was by Barna, um, and it was concerning evangelism. And it had some really interesting statistics about the importance of leading a child to Christ. And in there, it said that 19 out of every 20 people who become believers, who become Christians, uh, do so before they reach the age of 25. 19 out of 20, it's pretty good, right? After the age of 25, only 1 in 10,000 do so. And after the age of 35, only 1 in 50,000 do so. So they hear the truth. Only one in 10,000, one in 50,000 after the age of 35. Now, I don't want it to sound like I'm saying that you can 
um, because of your relationship with the Lord or because of your membership at a church or whatever, you can somehow grant your faith to your children. That's not what we're talking about here. We cannot impose our faith on our children. Uh, our children must choose the Lord for themselves. We cannot do it for them. But like Timothy's mom and grandma, you can and you should show them the Bible. You can and you should teach them to read it and to understand it. And you can and you should introduce them to a value system that grows out of the scriptures so that they can learn why right is right and why wrong is wrong. And so they can learn that life works best when it is centered around a personal walk with God. And you think about all the problems that we're having in our schools today. And you hear all the wild and crazy stories about furries and this, um, gender issues and all that. Why is that? Why are there so many issues? It's because they don't know what truth is anymore. They haven't been taught the truth. They've moved away from the truth. They took the Bible out of our schools. Christians are no longer being a visible witness in our schools. And so truth has been lost. That doesn't mean that truth has been lost for your children, though. Truth is always there, available to us in God's word. So we need to go back to God's word. That is where you will find absolute truth. Everything else in the world, truth is relative. But the one thing that you know is absolute truth, without a shadow of a doubt, that has proven itself for over 2,000 years, is the word of God. It has never made a mistake. It is never an error. It is not wrong. And, and Timothy's mom and grandma, they knew that. Even the Old Testament part they had, they didn't have the New Testament, but they knew this is valuable stuff. We need to teach this to our, to our child. So the most important lessons, actually, that we can teach our children when they're children are lessons about God and his love for them. If you think about that, so many kids nowadays don't know that God loves them. And so they go throughout life lonely, depressed, suicide rates go up. Why? Because they don't understand that God values them greatly and loves them immensely so much that he sent his son Jesus down the cross for them so that he could save them from their sins. That's amazing love. And the kiddos, they don't know about this. They don't know about this love. A lot of kids grow up in homes without a dad, but they could have a heavenly father. They could, but they just don't know about him because they haven't been taught the word of God. So Timothy, grandma and grandpa, he was blessed to have, um, uh, grandma and mother, I should say, he was blessed to have um, um, parents, basically, that understood this. You know, Patrick Henry, he's a famous American statesman. You guys probably know who he is. Um, he was getting to the end of his life, and he was working on his will. Um, and he said this concerning his estate. He said, I have now disposed of all my property to my family. There is one more thing I wish I could give them, and that is the Christian religion, the gospel. If they have that and I have not given them one shilling, they would have been rich. And if they had not that and I'd give them all the world, they would be poor. You know, the Apostle Paul said it way better in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, right? Where he said, what is more, I consider everything as loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Do you understand? Patrick Henry got it. He figured it out. I could give them all my wealth, but if that's the only thing I gave them was my wealth, my stuff, I've given them nothing. But if I can give them a personal relationship with the Lord or at least guide them toward that, I have given them everything, even if I didn't give them but a penny, right? He, he, I think he understood what Apostle Paul was saying there in Philippians. You know, there is no better way to bless our children than to introduce them to Jesus Christ and to teach them how much God loves them. Because most kids don't know that. You know, when Jesus um, gave us the Great Commission, right, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, what did he say? He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them, right, to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And I think it's safe to say that Lois and Eunice understood that their first mission field was their child, was their grandchild. That was their first mission field. They didn't have to go far to be a missionary, right? It was in their house right there. And they reached out to Timothy with the gospel, and then after Timothy got saved, what did they do? They didn't just leave it there and go, whew, he's saved, I'm, I'm done, I'm out. 
No, then they started teaching him what they knew from God's word so that he could handle God's word himself. And we should do the same thing. You know, our children are our first mission field. We should never stop praying for them. We should never start, stop reaching out to them. Okay, so we have seen that one of the goals of a godly mother is to pass her faith on to her children. Remember, I'm not saying that you can phys- actually do that, but you can lead them. You can guide them to the gospel. They will choose God for themselves, but we can do everything in our power to do that. That is one of the goals that a godly mother has. Next, we're going to see that a godly mother is a living example of Christ to her children. I'm going to cheat on this one. I'm going to bring the dads into this one as well. But a godly mother is a living example of Christ to her children. All right? So, you know, I find it bizarre that people are often concerned about what is said in front of the children. You've heard it before. Oh, don't say that the children are here, right? (laughs) You know, and, um, you know, they're concerned about what is said, but they're not so concerned about how they are living in front of their children. And, and, you know, there's that statement that says actions speak louder than what? Words, right? Yeah, and and it's a true statement. And, And children will forget a lot of the things that we have said but children will not forget how we live. A- and because of this truth, I b- it becomes absolutely essential that parents place their families under the authority of God's word. Well, what do I mean by that? Place your family under the authority of God's word. That means I as a parent, I as a dad, you a, a mother, I am going to submit my whole life to the authority of God's word. That means I'm not in charge anymore. My feelings don't matter on the issues all that matters is what God's word says and what his will is. Now, I know for a lot of us, that's like, whew, that, that's a big pill to swallow. But think about it. Be logical with me for a moment. Who created the universe? God. Who created man and woman? God. Who created marriage? God. Who created the family? God. Who gave us instructions on how to operate all these institutions? God. And you want to sit there and say that you know better than the one who allows you to take your next breath and keeps your heart beating. And actually, he's the one that keeps all the atoms together from splitting apart. You know better than him? And then we wonder why our lives aren't working out so great. Maybe as parents, as fathers, as mothers, we need to submit to the authority of God's word. Ooh, that's not very popular, is it? Yeah, but to me, it makes logical sense. Who am I than to tell God I know better than him? That's pretty foolish. So it becomes absolutely essential that we as parents, we submit to the authority of God's word. And as we do that, guess what's going to happen? We are going to live Christ-like lives in front of our children. What an amazing example. We are showing them how Christ lived as best as we can, right? Um, We're doing our best to do that. In other words, what I'm trying to say is oftentimes parents need to practice what they preach, right? Um, Another way of saying this is if we are to pass our faith on to our children, we must first possess faith. We must first be believers, right? But then we must then exercise that faith. We must do it. We must show that we actually do believe in it. And, 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 And this is where it all begins. We, we will never be the kind of parents we need to be to our children until we get our own lives right with the Lord, all right? You want to be a great mother? You want to be a great father? You want to be a great grandmother, great grandfather? Okay, start with yourself. Get your life right with God. Submit to the authority of God's word. Then you're going to be an amazing grandmother or grandfather. I guarantee it. You can say, Michael guaranteed on Mother's Day. Yeah. Why? Because I know God and I know God's word. And he says, if you do it my way, it's going to be okay. Right? So, so let me explain what I mean by all of this, all right? I have learned in my old years that kids are great observers. You know, sometimes they look like they're spaced out and then they're imaginary little worlds there, but they're not. They're fooling you. They're paying attention to everything that's going on, all right? They're totally aware. I, I came home uh, from work one day, and I made a big time, a, a lot of mistakes. 
but I made a big time mistake. I brought the problems of work home with me, and so I was really irritated by the things that had been happening at work, and I got home, and Heidi was there, uh, my wife, and then Tyler, and he was playing on the floor with his toys, and Heidi had done something. I don't even remember what it was, but it really bugged me, and so I started giving her a piece of my mind, and I was yelling and shouting, and I was saying things that were not nice things to be saying in a Christian way, and as I was doing that, my little boy looked up and started looking at me, and it was like somebody punched me in the stomach, because I realized, oh my goodness, what are you doing? I am showing and teaching and modeling for my son how to sin, and how to treat um, my wife with disrespect, how to dishonor the Lord. I was doing a bang-up job for the devil, wasn't I? And, it, and I just felt so terrible. And, and, and my little guy, Tyler, he was just soaking it all in. Uh, and it's important to understand, I want to repeat this, that not only was I sinning against God, not only was I sinning against my wife, not only was I at that moment in time being a very poor leader in my home, but I was teaching my son how to sin. I was not modeling Christ's likeness. I was not practicing what I knew from the scriptures. And then the thought occurred to me, how can I expect my son to respect my leadership? How can I expect my son to have a desire to apply God's word to his life when I wasn't doing it? And I had a little aha moment in my life then. You know, it is absolute key that we practice what we believe. Kids can spot a hypocrite a mile away. And you know what hypocrisy does to kids? It pushes them away from God. It pushes them away from the truth of God's word. Now, um, I've been in ministry most of my life. Uh, first, as a missionary kid, I helped my parents in church planning in Africa. And then I was a Sunday school teacher of a senior's high school, Sunday school, that was fun. And then I had a young adult, uh, young married, sorry, young marrieds. Um, I've also done young adults. Uh, I was a Sunday school teacher there. And then I was a camp director for a couple years, and, and then I was a church planner, all right? A and over these many years, uh, I have heard and seen how parents will complain about the trouble they're having with their children. Uh, now, having trouble with kids, you guys have to understand this, that's normal, okay? Um, Believe it or not, your children are not born as angels. They are born as sinners, and so they're going to do what sinners do. They're going to misbehave. They're going to do what sinners do, right? Um, they're going to respond according to their nature, and they're sinful. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I, I've seen parents have complaints, um, or they'll have a prayer request, that their child is hanging out with the wrong crowd, right? Right? Um, their child is getting into trouble at school. Um, their child is a habitual liar. Uh, their child is drinking or experiencing, experimenting with drugs. Um, and, and I've seen this, and um, I've talked to other pastors, and I've read about this uh, through counseling books that I've read, um, that typically these kids that are coming from, and this is typically, I'm not saying it's a blanket statement, but typically these kids come from families where the parents never made living a God-centered life a priority, all right? Um, and this is in church. I think a lot of times you come to church and you act like you've got it all figured out. Oh, I'm holy. Oh, I'm a follower of Christ. Oh, I do all the right things because I have a good testimony at church. But then you get ho home. Well, that's what the child sees, how you really are like, all right? And that's what I'm talking about here. I don't really feel like that's making God the priority in your life, if that's how you're living. Um, they're not making God's word the final authority in your life. Um, um, then you'll start to notice trends, and I did notice these trends, where parents didn't make regular church attendance a priority. Oh, well, we'll go to church when we feel like it. Um, it, it. It just wasn't a priority to them or to their family. Now, don't misunderstand me as I'm painting this picture of these families for you. I am not saying that these parents were neglecting the child, all right? No, uh, they, they were allowing their kids to participate in lots of extracurricular activities. I mean, when you look at what those kids were doing at the school, 
Um, th they would be doing things like choir practice and soccer practice and hockey practice and, and piano lessons. And let me tell you about soccer because I was a soccer dad. My wife was a soccer mom and our kids played soccer. I even coached it. Can you believe that? Yeah. And so what would happen is you'd go and you would have s practice on Monday and it would be brutal because those kids are little misbehaving urchins, right? So I just had them run laps until they were so exhausted they couldn't disobey anymore. Um, Wednesday would be practice again. Friday would be practice and getting ready for the game. And then Saturday we'd have to drive for forever to get to the game. And then we'd play the game, right? And so that's how it would go. And then all these people on our team, uh, they also went to our church, okay? I'm going to leave out the name <laughs> of the church. And um, I'd go to church on Sunday, and no one would be there that was on the team. Where was everybody? They're tired. That's right, they're tired, because we drove all over the show, and they've been doing soccer practice and going to the game and getting home late, et cetera, et cetera. They were tired, so they didn't come to church. What do you think that tells a kid about how important God is to your family? Huh, they sit there, they're observing the situation, they're not dumb. Soccer is important. One day I'm going to become a bazillionaire. I'm going to be the 0.05% of the population that actually is good at something like that. And I'm going to become a superstar soccer player. It must be because mom and dad are putting so much effort into me becoming this amazing soccer player. But when it comes to church, we only go to that when it fits us, when we're not tired. Um, and so God can't be that important to my life. I mean, he needs to be an aspect of my life, maybe nice, but he's not the priority, right? How else would you read that as a child? I mean, that's the first thing you're going to think. Is this God's not that important to my parents because it's not a priority. You know, and, and the other way around, it, sh it should be, right? Well, we're going to church. I'm going to drag you there if I have to. I don't care if you're s sleepy. We're going. Now, that means something totally different. Soccer was fun, but this is more important regardless of how I feel. Do you understand how the parents are missing the opportunity to teach their children? All right. So now the child is in trouble, and, and, and they want to know what they can do then to, to get their child back to the Lord. But basically what I'm trying to say here, it isn't a parent's overall priority to live their lives oriented towards God. They don't get up in the morning and think, how can I glorify God today with my life? How can I be like Christ to people around me and encourage them with their walk with the Lord? If you don't wake up in the morning and have that attitude, your children certainly aren't going to have it. They're not going to have it modeled in front of them. Now, if it isn't a priority for you to make God's word the authority of your life, which is work, you have to place yourself under God's authority, right? It doesn't just naturally happen. Your flesh is going to fight it. It doesn't want to be under the authority. You want to be God. You want to be the one in charge. You don't want to tell God, oh, yeah, I'll submit to you. Submission, remember, is a swear word we don't like to talk about. All right? So if it's not a priority in your life, it's not going to be a priority in their life, and God's word is going to have no bearing on their lives. It's just a nice religious thing that mommy and daddy do every now and then. So we need to understand that kids are a product of two things. One, it is their life experience, and two, it is how they interact with that life experience. And I was reading up on this, experts in child development say the following are issues that shape a child's heart. Okay, are you ready? Number one, family life that shapes a child's heart. Family values, family roles, family conflict resolution, family response to failure, family history. So we have to ask ourselves, right, well, well, how are we doing in these areas that are foundational to shaping our child's heart? Are we striving to follow the scriptures in each of these areas of our lives, or are we not doing so well in some of these areas, all right? These are the areas that shape a child's heart. So, so we as parents, we need to make sure that we are following God's word. We're doing our very best to obey God to obeying God's word in these areas by applying biblical principles to these very practical areas of our life. That's what we should be doing. That's one of the main roles as a parent. And if we don't, 
what ends up happening is we end up frustrating our children with our hypocrisy. And we know what hypocrisy does, right? It pushes them away from the truth of God's word. So we need to be aware of that. So, so my challenge to parents today, uh, to you guys, people listening on, on YouTube, um, is that we will determine in our hearts and in our minds to consistently and persistently make God's word the priority in our family's life. We're going to make that commitment. And if you haven't made that commitment in the past, it's okay. Today is a new day. Start today. It's all right. Well, I'm a grandparent. Well, that's fine. Start today in your grandparenting. It's okay. God understands. He'll help you. We need to obey God's word in all things, and we need to do it as a matter of intentionality, as a matter of priority. What do I mean by that? Don't live your life in a reactionary way. Pre-plan. Be organized. Be intentional. Don't go through life like, whoa, didn't see that one coming. No, the Bible is full of warnings to tell us what to expect, right? So we can be intentional on how we're going to parent, how we're going to be a grandparent. And this, this applies to everything, not just parenting. We don't have to go through life being sideswiped by something we didn't expect. No, I'm, I'm going to be ready for it. I'm going to study God's word. I'm going to know how he wants me to handle these things. And, and the thing I've always done in my life, personally, is I'm very much not perfect. I'll make a mistake, and I'm like, oh, I messed up, like the example I gave you. I messed up big time. Well, let's make plans. Let's be intentional on not making that mistake again, right? Um, this isn't in the Bible, but my favorite coach in basketball is Mike Krzyzewski of the Duke Blue Devils. What a terrible name to be talking about a basketball team with the name Blue Devils. But anyway, he said, you're not dumb for making a mistake, but you are dumb if you make the same mistake twice. Now, that's not in the Bible, but it always resonated with me. I'm like, Ugh. it's okay. If you make a lot of the same mistakes, God will forgive you. He's not going to call you dumb <laughs> like Mike Krzyzewski. But let's be smart about it, right? Let's be intentional. When we mess up, let's fix it. Let's do it God's way the next time. Okay, so we've seen that one of the goals a godly mother has is to pass her faith on to her children. Then we saw... Another goal was to be a living example of Christ to her children. Finally, we're going to see a godly mother prays for her children, all right? And I, and I believe this is one of the ways a mother can have a huge impact on the lives of her children. A and that is by praying earnestly, by praying regularly, and by praying passionately for their children or for their grandchildren. You can have a huge impact on their lives. Why do I say that? Well, I'd like to end the sermon with reading to you some excerpts from some biographies of some famous people where it talks about what their moms did for them in the world of prayer, okay? So this is going to be a little bit different when we're reading to you now, but I don't know how else to do it. And I was blessed by it. I'm like, I want to bless you guys with this because it was cool. So the first example I'm going to read to you from is from the life of Robert Moffat. In case you're wondering, this is a spoiler alert, but... He was one of the first missionaries into Southern Africa and was responsible for spreading the gospel to the African peoples. You all know about David Livingston. Well, he was before David Livingston. He was super cool, all right? So this is from his um, biography. Stop needling me, mother. If Robert Moffat didn't say it, at least he was thinking it when his mother volunteered some advice as her son prepared to leave home. Earnestly, she sought to get him to promise that he would read his Bible and pray twice daily. Robert tried to ignore her entreaties, but at the moment of parting, his mother once again implored, Son, please promise me to read the Bible. The youth recognized that he dare not refuse. Yes, mother, he replied, I promise. Later, he explained to his acquaintances who inquired about this practice of him, always reading and praying. And he said, My promise once made must be kept his promise to his mom. You see, if a mother had not needled, South Africa might have not had its first pioneering missionary. All right? And so what a great example. The next one I want to read to you is from another famous person that I'm pretty sure you'll know of this guy. Um, his name is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He's the Prince of Preachers. Um, and this is an excerpt from a biography written on him. Um, he's paying tribute to his mother. 
I cannot tell you how much I owe to the solemn words and prayers of my Christian mother. It was a custom while we were children to sit around the table and read the scriptures verse by verse while mother explained it to us. After this was done, then came the time of pleading with God. All right, now this is kind of the older style English, pleading with God. She's now read the scriptures to them around the table. She has now explained to them what the scriptures were talking about, because, you know, sometimes it's hard to understand. And now she's going to pray for the kids and everyone there at the table. All right, pleading with God. Some of the words of our mother's prayers we shall never forget, even when our heads are gray. I remember her once praying thus. This is how she was praying. Now, Lord, if my children go on in sin, it will not be from ignorance that they perish. My soul must bear a swift witness against them at the day of judgment if they lay not hold of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Okay, let me explain to you what uh, she was basically saying. Lord, if they don't accept Christ as their Savior and live for you, it won't be because of me. I've told them everything they need to know, and I will stand there at the judgment seat and say, hey, I told them what they need to know. It's on them that they didn't believe, all right? He, she would pray this in front of her kids. <laughs> I love that, all right? Sp- <laughs> Spurgeon, he went on to become one of the most effective evangelical preachers of all time. I wonder why, <laughs> you know? I'm like, oh my goodness, this is serious, right? Um, and it was because of his ministry that many preacher boys came down Um, out of the seminary to preach the gospel in South Africa as well. So Spurgeon sent a lot of preacher boys to South Africa. All right, the last example, one that you might not know of. um, This is by a Scottish preacher. His name was John McNeil. Uh, When he was 21, he came home from a gospel crusade at 12 o'clock at night, and he had just given his heart to Jesus, right? He just accepted Christ as his Savior, and his mother was asleep, but he awoke her to tell her the good news. He told her he had accepted Christ Jesus as a Savior, and he was going to be a preacher of the gospel. And he asked, Are you glad, Mother? And drawing his face down to her, she answered, I have prayed for that before you were born. Isn't that amazing? So from all these examples, you can see the earnesty and, and the regularity and, and, and the passion in those mothers' prayers and the way that they talk to their children, the way that they, they, they train their children. And I really feel like we can learn from their example, right? Um, We must begin to pray fervently and regularly for our children. Um, We should pray for the conversion of our children, that they would accept Christ as their Savior. Uh, We too should pray that our children will grow in their knowledge of the Scriptures and grow in their relationship with the Lord as believers. Um, We want our children to be effective servants for the Lord. And that, that is way more important than being a star on the soccer field. That's way more important than owning a nice mansion here on earth. If your child is living a life that is glorifying God and encouraging others in their walk with the Lord, that is an invaluable legacy. You can't put a value on that, all right? So those are three characteristics of a godly mother that I believe uh, Timothy's um, mother and grandmother possessed. Um, And I think Right now, we probably should just go to the Lord, right? And ask him to have that same impact on our kids, right? So let's, let's close as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, for doing what we could not do for ourselves. Lord, it saddens my heart to think that people think that they can earn their way into heaven. What a silly notion, Lord. We are so sinful and our best is like filthy rags before you. Lord, we needed Jesus to come and die for us. Um, thank you that he lived the perfect life. Thank you that he was the spotless lamb, the perfect sacrifice that you accepted. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as a Savior, that today would be the day that they would submit to your word and that they would submit and accept Christ as their Savior, that they would place their faith in him for their salvation. Lord, I pray that same prayer for our children. I am sure there are moms and grandmas sitting here that have kids and grandkids that don't know Christ as their Savior yet. And I pray, Lord, that that they would someday soon accept Christ as their Savior. Lord, I pray that you would help us as parents and as future parents to commit to submitting to the authority of your word, that we would live in such a way where others would be able to see Christ in us, that our children would be able to see Christ in us, and that we'd be a living example of encouragement to them. 
Lord, I pray that you would just um, help us to uh, have those opportunities to continue to bless our children um, with your word. Thank you for the example, example of Timothy's uh, parents, his, his mom and grandma, uh, Eunice and Lois. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to follow in their footsteps. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. You are dismissed. <laughs>